Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 7 The Bean Field. Meanwhile, my beans, the length of whose rows added together was seven miles already planted, were impatient to be hoed, for the earliest had grown considerably before the latest were in the ground. Indeed, they were not easily to be put off. What was the meaning of this so steady and self-respecting, this small Herculean labor, I knew not. I came to love my rows, my beans, though so many more than I wanted. They attached me to the earth, and so I got strength, like Antaeus. But why should I raise them? Only heaven knows. This was my curious labor all summer to make this portion of the earth's surface, which had yielded only sank foil, blackberries, John's wart, and the like before. Sweet wild fruits and pleasant flowers produce instead this pulse. What shall I learn of beans, or beans of me? I cherish them, I hoe them, early and late I have an eye to them, and this is my day's work. It is a fine, broad leaf to look on. My auxiliaries are the dews and rains which water this dry soil. And what fertility is in the soil itself, which for the most part is lean and effete? My enemies are worms, cool days, and most of all woodchucks. The last have nibbled for me a quarter of an acre clean. But what right had I to oust John's wart and the rest and break up their ancient herb garden? Soon, however, the remaining beans will be too tough for them and go forward to meet new foes. When I was four years old, as I well remember, I was brought from Boston to this my native town, through these very woods and this field, to the pond. It is one of the oldest scenes stamped on my memory. And now, tonight, my flute has waked the echoes over that very water. The pines still stand here older than I, or if some have fallen, I have cooked my supper with their stumps. And a new growth is rising all around, preparing another aspect for new infant eyes. Almost the same John Zwart springs from the same perennial root in this pasture. And even I have at length helped to clothe that fabulous landscape of my infant dreams. And one of the results of my presence and influence is seen in these bean leaves, corn blades, and potato vines. I planted about two acres and a half of upland and as it was only about fifteen years since the land was cleared, and I myself had got out two or three cords of stumps, I did not give it any manure. But in the course of the summer it appeared by the arrowheads which I turned up in the hoeing, that an extinct nation had anciently dwelled here and planted corn and beans ere white men came to clear the land, and so to some extent had exhausted the soil for this very crop. Before yet any woodchuck or squirrel had run across the road or the sun had got above the shrub oaks, while all the dew was on, though the farmers warned me against it, I would advise you to do all your work, if possible, while the dew is on. I began to level the ranks of haughty weeds in my beanfield and throw dust upon their heads. Early in the morning I worked barefooted, dabbling like a plastic artist in the dewy and crumbling sand. But later in the day the sun blistered my feet. There the sun lighted me to hoe beans, pacing slowly backward and forward over that yellow gravelly upland between the long green rows, fifteen rods, the one end terminating in a shrub oak copse where I could rest in the shade, the other in a blackberry field, where the green berries deepened their tints by the time I had made another bout, removing the weeds, putting fresh soil about the bean stems, and encouraging this weed which I had sown, 
making the yellow soil express its summer thought in bean leaves and blossoms rather than in wormwood and piper and millet grass, making the earth say beans instead of grass. This was my daily work. As I had little aid from horses or cattle or hired men or boys or improved implements of husbandry, I was much slower and became much more intimate with my beans than usual. But labor of the hands, even when pursued to the verge of drudgery, is perhaps never the worst form of idleness. It has a constant and imperishable moral, and to the scholar it yields a classic result, a very agricola laboriosus, was I to travellers bound westward through Lincoln and Wayland to nobody knows where, they sitting at their ease in gigs with elbows on knees and reins loosely hanging in festoons, I the homestaying laborious native of the soil. But soon my homestead was out of their sight and thought. It was the only open and cultivated field for a great distance on either side of the road. So they made the most of it and sometimes the man in the field heard more of traveller's gossip and comment than was meant for his ear. "'Beans so late? Peas so late?' For I continued to plant when others had begun to hoe. The ministerial husbandman had not suspected it. "'Corn, my boy, for fodder, corn for fodder! Does he live there?' asks the black bonnet of the grey coat, and the hard-featured farmer reins up his grateful dobbin to inquire what you are doing where he sees no manure in the furrow, and recommends a little chip dirt or any little waste stuff, or it may be ashes or plaster. But here were two acres and a half of furrows, and only a hoe for cart and two hands to draw it, there being an aversion to other carts and horses, and chip dirt far away. Fellow travellers, as they rattled by, compared it aloud with the fields which they had passed, so that I came to know how I stood in the agricultural world. This was one field not in Mr. Coleman's report. And by the way, who estimates the value of the crop which nature yields in the still wilder fields unimproved by man? The crop of English hay is carefully weighed, the moisture calculated, the silicates and the potash, but in all dells and pond holes in the woods and pastures and swamps grows a rich and various crop only unreaped by man. Mine was, as it were, the connecting link between wild and cultivated fields. As some states are civilized and others half-civilized and others savage or barbarous, so my field was, though not in a bad sense, a half-cultivated field. They were beans, cheerfully returning to their wild and primitive state that I cultivated, and my hoe played the rangs de vache for them. Near at hand, upon the topmost spray of a birch, sings the brown thrasher, or Red Mavis, as some love to call him, all the morning glad of your society that would find out another farmer's field if yours were not here. While you are planting the seed, he cries, Drop it! Drop it! Cover it up! Cover it up! Pull it up! Pull it up! Pull it up! But this was not corn, and so it was safe from such enemies as he. You may wonder what his rigmarole, his amateur Paganini performances on one string or on twenty, have to do with your planting, and yet prefer it to leached ashes or plaster. It was a cheap sort of top dressing in which I had entire faith. As I drew a still fresher soil about the rose with my hoe, I disturbed the ashes of unchronicled nations who in primeval years lived under these heavens and their small implements of war and hunting were brought to the light of this modern day. 
they lay mingled with other natural stones, some of which bore the marks of having been burned by Indian fires, and some by the sun, and also bits of pottery and glass brought hither by the recent cultivators of the soil. When my hoe tinkled against the stones, that music echoed to the woods in the sky, and was an accompaniment to my labor, which yielded an instant and immeasurable crop. It was no longer beans that I hoed, nor I that hoed beans, and I remembered with as much pity as pride, if I remembered at all, my acquaintances who had gone to the city to attend the oratorios. The night hawk circled overhead in the sunny afternoons, for I sometimes made a day of it, like a moat in the eye, or in heaven's eye, falling from time to time with a swoop and a sound as if the heavens were rent, torn at last to very rags and tatters, and yet a seamless cope remained. Small imps that fill the air and lay their eggs on the ground on bare sand or rocks on the tops of hills, where few have found them, graceful and slender like ripples caught up from the pond, as leaves are raised by the wind to float in the heavens. Such kindredship is in nature. The hawk is aerial brother of the wave which he sails over and surveys. Those his perfect air-inflated wings answering to the elemental unfledged pinions of the sea or sometimes I watched a pair of hen-hawks circling high in the sky, alternately soaring and descending, approaching and leaving one another, as if they were the embodiment of my own thoughts. Or I was attracted by the passage of wild pigeons from this wood to that, with a slight quivering winnowing sound and carrier haste, or from under a rotten stump my hoe turned up a sluggish, portentous, and outlandish spotted salamander, a trace of Egypt in the Nile, yet our contemporary. When I paused to lean on my hoe, these sounds and sights I heard and saw anywhere in the row, a part of the inexhaustible entertainment which the country offers. On gala days, the town fires its great guns, which echo like pop-guns to these woods, and some waifs of martial music occasionally penetrate thus far. To me, away there in my bean-field at the other end of the town, the big guns sounded as if a puff-ball had burst, and when there was a military turnout of which I was ignorant, I have sometimes had a vague sense all the day of some sort of itching and disease in the horizon, as if some eruption would break out there soon, either scarlatina or canker rash, until at length some more favorable puff of wind, making haste over the fields and up the wayland road, brought me information of these trainers. It seemed by the distant hum as if somebody's bees had swarmed, and that the neighbors, according to Virgil's advice, by a faint tintinabulum upon the most sonorous of their domestic utensils, were endeavoring to call them down into the hive again. And when the sound died quite away, and the hum had ceased, and the most favorable breezes told no tale, I knew that they had got the last drone of them all safely into the Middlesex hive, and that now their minds were bent on the honey with which it was smeared. I felt proud to know that the liberties of Massachusetts and of our fatherland were in such safe keeping, and as I turned to my hoeing again I was filled with an inexpressible confidence, and pursued my labor cheerfully with a calm trust in the future. When there were several bands of musicians, it sounded as if all the village was a vast bellows, and all the buildings expanded and collapsed alternately with a din. But sometimes it was a really noble and inspiring strain that reached these woods, 
and the trumpet that sings of fame, and I felt as if I could spit a Mexican with a good relish, for why should we always stand for trifles, and looked round for a woodchuck or a skunk to exercise my chivalry upon. These martial strains seemed as far away as Palestine, and reminded me of a march of crusaders in the horizon, with a slight tantivy and tremulous motion of the elm-tree tops which overhang the village. This was one of the great days, though the sky had from my clearing only the same everlastingly great look that it wears daily, and I saw no difference in it. It was a singular experience that long acquaintance which I cultivated with beans, what with planting and hoeing and harvesting and threshing and picking over and selling them, the last was the hardest of all. I might add eating, for I did taste. I was determined to know beans. When they were growing I used to hoe from five o'clock in the morning till noon, and commonly spent the rest of the day about other affairs. Consider the intimate and curious acquaintance one makes with various kinds of weeds. It will bear some iteration in the account, for there was no little iteration in the labor, disturbing their delicate organization so ruthlessly, and making such invidious distinctions with his hoe, leveling whole ranks of one species, and sedulously cultivating another. That's Roman wormwood. That's pigweed, that's sorrel, that's piper grass. Have at him, chop him up, turn his roots upward to the sun, don't let him have a fibre in the shade. If you do, he'll turn himself to other side up, and be as green as a leek in two days. A long war, not with cranes, but with weeds, those Trojans who had sun and rain and dews on their side. Daily the beans saw me come to their rescue, armed with a hoe, and thinned the ranks of their enemies, filled up the trenches with weedy dead. Many a lusty crest, waving Hector, that towered a whole foot above his crowding comrades, fell before my weapon, and rolled in the dust. Those summer days which some of my contemporaries devoted to the fine arts in Boston or Rome, and others to contemplation in India, and others to trade in London or New York, I thus, with the other farmers of New England, devoted to husbandry. Not that I wanted beans to eat, for I am by nature a Pythagorean, so far as beans are concerned, whether they mean porridge or voting, and exchange them for rice. But perchance, as some must work in fields, if only for the sake of tropes and expression, to serve a parable-maker one day, it was on the whole a rare amusement which, continued too long, might have become a dissipation. Though I gave them no manure, and did not hoe them all at once, I hoed them unusually well as far as I went, and was paid for it in the end. There being, in truth, as Evelyn says, no compost or latation whatsoever comparable to this continual motion, repastination, and turning of the mould with the spade. The earth, he adds elsewhere, especially if fresh, has a certain magnetism in it by which it attracts the salt, power, or virtue, call it either, which gives it life, and is the logic of all the labour and stir we keep about it to sustain us. All the dungings and other sordid temperings being but the vicar's succedaneous to this improvement. Moreover, this being one of those worn-out and exhausted lay fields which enjoy their Sabbath, had perchance, as Sir Kenelm Digby thinks likely, attracted vital spirits from the air. I harvested twelve bushels of beans. But to be more particular, for it is complained that Mr. Coleman has reported chiefly the expensive experiments of gentlemen farmers, my outgoes were, for a hoe, fifty-four cents, plowing, harrowing, and furrowing, 
seven dollars and fifty cents. Too much. Beans for seed, three dollars and twelve cents plus. Potatoes for seed, one dollar and thirty-three cents. Peas for seed, forty cents. Turnip seed, six cents. White line for crow fence, two cents. Horse cultivator and boy, three hours, one dollar. Horse and cart to get crop, seventy-five cents. In all, fourteen dollars, seventy-two cents plus. My income was patrem familius vendesum non emassum es apportet from nine bushels and twelve quarts of beans sold, sixteen dollars ninety-four cents. Five bushels large potatoes, two dollars fifty cents. Nine bushels small potatoes, two dollars and twenty-five cents. Grass, one dollar. Stocks, seventy-five cents. In all, twenty-three dollars forty-four cents, leaving a pecuniary profit, as I have elsewhere said, of eight dollars seventy-one cents plus. This is the result of my experience in raising beans. Plant the common small white bush bean about the first of June, in rows three feet by eighteen inches apart, being careful to select fresh, round, and unmixed seed. First look out for worms, and supply vacancies by planting anew. Then look out for woodchucks, if it is an exposed place, for they will nibble off the nearest tender leaves almost clean as they go, and again when the young tendrils make their appearance they have notice of it, and will shear them off with both buds and young pods, sitting erect like a squirrel. But above all, harvest as early as possible. If you would escape frosts and have a fair and saleable crop, you may save much loss by this means. This further experience also I gained. I said to myself, I will not plant beans and corn with so much industry another summer, but such seeds, if the seed is not lost, as sincerity, truth, simplicity, faith, innocence, and the like, and see if they will not grow in this soil, even with less toil and manurance, and sustain me, for surely it has not been exhausted for these crops. Alas, I said this to myself, but now another summer is gone, and another, and another, and I am obliged to say to you, reader, that the seeds which I planted, if indeed they were the seeds of those virtues, were worm-eaten or had lost their vitality, and so did not come up. Commonly men will only be brave as their fathers were brave, or timid. This generation is very sure to plant corn and beans each new year precisely as the Indians did centuries ago, and taught the first settlers to do, as if there were a fate in it. I saw an old man the other day, to my astonishment, making the holes with a hoe for the seventieth time at least, and not for himself to lie down in. But why should not the New Englander try new adventures? and not lay so much stress on his grain, his potato and grass crop, and his orchards, raise other crops than these. Why concern ourselves so much about our beans for seed, and not be concerned at all about a new generation of men? We should really be fed and cheered if, when we met a man, we were sure to see that some of the qualities which I have named, which we all prize more than those other productions, but which are for the most part broadcast and floating in the air, had taken root and grown in him. Here comes such a subtle and ineffable quality, for instance, as truth or justice, though the slightest amount or new variety of it along the road. Our ambassadors should be instructed to send home such seeds as these, and Congress helped to distribute them over all the land. We should never stand upon ceremony with sincerity. We should never cheat and insult and banish one another by our meanness. If there were present the kernel of worth 
and friendliness. We should not meet thus in haste. Most men I do not meet at all, for they seem not to have time. They are busy about their beans. We would not deal with a man thus plodding ever, leaning on a hoe or a spade as a staff between his work, not as a mushroom, but partially risen out of the earth, something more than erect, like swallows alighted and walking on the ground. And as he spake, his wings would now and then spread, as he meant to fly, then close again, so that we should suspect that we might be conversing with an angel. Bread may not always nourish us, but it always does us good. It even takes stiffness out of our joints, and makes us supple and buoyant, when we knew not what ailed us, to recognize any generosity in man or nature, to share any unmixed and heroic joy. Ancient poetry and mythology suggest at least that husbandry was once a sacred art, but it is pursued with irreverent haste and heedlessness by us, our object being to have large farms and large crops merely. We have no festival, no procession, no ceremony, not excepting our cattle shows and so-called thanksgivings, by which the farmer expresses a sense of the sacredness of his calling, or is reminded of its sacred origin. It is the premium and the feast which tempt him. He sacrifices not to Ceres and the terrestrial Jove, but to the infernal Plutus, rather. By avarice and selfishness, and a groveling habit, from which none of us is free, of regarding the soil as property, or the means of acquiring property, chiefly. The landscape is deformed, husbandry is degraded with us, and the farmer leads the meanest of lives. He knows nature but as a robber. Cato says that the prophets of agriculture are particularly pious or just. Maximic pius questus. And according to Vero, the old Romans, called the same earth mother and Ceres, and thought that they who cultivate it led a pious and useful life, and that they alone were left of the race of King Saturn. We are wont to forget that the sun looks on our cultivated fields and on the prairies and forests without distinction. They all reflect and absorb his rays alike, and the former make but a small part of the glorious picture which he beholds in his daily course. In his view the earth is all equally cultivated like a garden. Therefore we should receive the benefit of his light and heat with a corresponding trust and magnanimity. What though I value the seed of these beans, and harvest that in the fall of the year? This broad field which I have looked at so long looks not to me as the principal cultivator, but away from me to influences more genial to it, which water and make it green. These beans have results which are not harvested by me. Do they not grow for woodchucks, partly? The ear of wheat, in Latin spica, obsoletely specca, from spe, hope, should not be the only hope of the husbandman. Its kernel or grain, granum, from gerendo, bearing, is not all that it bears. How then can our harvest fail? Shall I not rejoice also at the abundance of the weeds, whose seeds are the granary of the birds? It matters little comparatively whether the fields fill the farmer's barns. The true husbandman will cease from anxiety, as the squirrels manifest no concern whether the woods will bear chestnuts this year or not, and finish his labor with every day relinquishing all claim to the produce of his fields, and sacrificing in his mind not only his first, but his last fruits also. 
End of chapter 7